Listen to the word of the Lord found in Acts 9, 1 through 6. Now Saul, still breathing murder and threats against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for the letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And it came about that as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, you who, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and it shall be told you what you must do. Thank you, Judy. Ellen's probably thinking, why didn't I get that scripture to read after what you read last week, right? <laughs> if you'd like to read sometime, just let me know. I think I know who to get in touch with to make that happen. That's a joke. <laughs> Loses something when you have to tell people that. Have you ever been surprised by a person? Have you ever been surprised by somebody you thought you knew really well? That is, you've gotten to know them and you thought you knew how they would behave in certain circumstances and then they behaved differently or they were changed. Anybody ever been there? You've been shocked by human behavior? You've lived a few days if that's happened to you. I think we all have that happen. At some point in time, we get shocked. We think that the people we know are predictable and we think we know how they react. And then all of a sudden, something different happens. You know, the years I spent as a banker, one of the things that we hated was being surprised. Bankers don't like surprises. They like to think they know how you're going to behave. And if you behave differently, it's almost never good. We spent a lot of time doing analysis before we'd lend somebody money. We would get to know them. We would take them to lunch. You, you thought maybe in commercial banking you'd just be getting a free lunch. It was, it was to see if we could get to know you. Uh, if you really want to get to know somebody, play golf with them and see if they cheat when you're not looking. That tells you all kinds of things that you might want to know. Uh, so you would spend time with somebody. You would get their financial reports. Uh, we would do trend analysis and we would look at all sorts of things so that we could become comfortable and get to know them. We'd pull their credit report. You, you see what I'm saying? And then look at that and decide whether we'd want to lend to somebody. And it really came down to a wise lender once told me, he says, Patrick, you need to decide whether you want to lend them money. You need to decide whether if it were your money, you would lend it to them. And, and what you really want to know is, is when things go wrong, how are they going to behave? Now, how many of you have ever had anything go wrong in your life? Okay, let me tell you something. If you lend enough people enough money, something is going to go wrong at some point in their life. And what you want to know is, is, is this person of the kind of character when things go wrong, are they going to stand up? And you don't want to be surprised. Trust me. Because those are never fun meetings when you have to explain somebody higher up why you were surprised. But what really concerned me about being surprised when I thought about it and I began to back into the process of why it bothered me so much <clears throat> was because it said something very deep. It said, I wasn't able to predict how that person was going to behave. I didn't really know them. And even after all that I had gotten to know them and I felt like I really knew them, do you see the problem is, well, if I'm wrong about that person, maybe I'm wrong about all the other people. Maybe I'm wrong about all sorts of things I think I know. So it begins to shake your faith in people. It begins to shake your faith in yourself of am I any good at judging this? Do you understand what I'm saying here? Is it, and, and the underlying pinning of this is this thought. And, and it occurred to me as I thought about it a little bit more, I came to this thought is people don't change. You see, that's the basis of that thought, and it's the base 
of something we all know, you, you may know the rest of this saying is, leopards don't change their spots. It's a well-known saying. Now, why do we say it? Because there's some truth to it, isn't it? I mean, how often do we really know people who change? Leopards don't change their spots. People don't change. We know that people remain very constant, but yet every once in a while, we're surprised. Maybe it's because we didn't know them that well, or we didn't know all the circumstances. But in the Scripture today, what we're really subjected to is we're looking at a case of Paul, and excuse me, at this point, Saul becomes Paul. You know the story quite well, right? He's on the road to Damascus. He is breathing murderous threats. Now, I don't know exactly what that means, but it sounds like he's murdering under his breath what he's going to do to other people. You ever done that? If I could just get a hold of that boy? Maybe y'all had never done that with your children. But I'm thinking that's what it means. Underneath his breath, he's just seething with what he's going to do. And he's been sent on a mission by the Sanhedrin to go and capture those of the way. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? People of the way. It's not believers in Christ. It's those who are living in a certain ethical set of boundaries. It seems as though there might be some misunderstanding what's going on. We have at least six times in the New Testament, especially in Acts, of us being described as people of the way. We get it from, of course, you know, right? Where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So here Paul is, he's pursuing the people of the way, and he is interrupted. His day is stopped. And I want to present to you that in this scripture, there are at least two miracles. There are two miracles. One is Jesus confronts Saul. There, there is the miracle of Christ coming to earth and presenting himself to Jesus. And you know what? That's just a miracle. That is outside the realm of ordinary, everyday life. The second miracle is this. Saul becomes Paul. A person changes. Let me tell you something. If you've lived long enough, you'll learn to categorize People changing is a miracle. Because I have found very seldomly that people change. And when they do, it's a miracle. And so I will present to you today that there are two miracles. Christ coming and Saul becoming Paul. He changes. But as I thought about his change, and I began to think about it on a very deep level, I said, what's actually really different about Saul to Paul? What's the huge difference that's going on here? We, we kind of know it when we see it, right? But what's the real change? We, we look at Saul. He was highly educated from the city of Tarsus. He was one of the most educated of his day. Uh, Josephus said that he was trained in one of the best synagogues. He was highly educated, powerful. He was a Roman citizen. And if you're a Roman citizen, you couldn't be crucified. So he was kind of the top shelf of the people, trained within the Sanhedrin. Now, did that change at all? Well, no, it didn't. He was still highly educated. He was highly religious, wasn't he? Was he highly religious afterwards? Uh, was he a zealot before? Well, he was a zealot before. Was he zealous afterwards? Well, yeah, if you read the whole New Testament, this guy is still very zealous. I'm you know, I, I just begin to wonder through this. I go, what's the difference between Saul and Paul? Y'all follow me? What's the difference between these two guys? And, and I boiled it down to this. Saul got on board with God's will. Saul went from what he thought God's will was to what God's will is. He, he got on board from thinking who Jesus was to understanding and knowing who the real Jesus is. He was confronted by the living presence of Christ, and the change was what he knew about Christ to what he came to know about Christ. And all that made a huge difference in how the rest of his life is lived. You follow the big difference? He wasn't changed as a person. He was changed in who he believed in. 
And that's a change that happens to all of us as we accept Christ, isn't it? It's a change not of who we authentically are, but we finally become who we're authentically supposed to be. And Saul finally moves to being Paul. But as I thought about this, I thought, why in the world didn't somebody who was highly religious knew all of the Old Testament really well? How in the world did he not know who Jesus was before? How is it that he, he missed God's will? C can you understand how that would be a relevant question for me? I, I, I can learn all of the Scripture, yet I can still miss God's will. Paul knew all of the Scripture. He was highly religious. Was he serious? I would say yes. Was he from a really good family? He was from a great family. He had probably had a great upbringing. He had, he's the very opposite of what the disciples were, yet the disciples knew what God's will was, and Saul missed it. This concerns me. It concerns me because it could be describing me. It could be describing us. Well, as I looked at the reason Saul might get this wrong, there's two, two reasons I come to. One is, is that he was enamored with being Jewish. If you read about him in later in the New Testament, you'll see many places where he says that he was very proud of his Jewish status. He was born Jewish. In fact, he was Jewish of Jewness. I mean, he was as much as you could be this. Born, raised, and in love with it. And on top of that, he had a position of power and prestige in it. Do you see how that might cloud your view? Uh, do you see how being born into power and prestige and education and being born into this place of being really comfortable with how things are might cloud you seeing what God might be doing? And, and then the second thing, I think the other thing that really clouded his vision was this, is Jesus didn't look how Jesus was supposed to look. Jesus, the anointed one of God, was supposed to come as a king, one who was going to set Israel free. But Jesus came as a servant and was nailed on a cross. He, he didn't look the way that Paul, Saul, thought he should. And then he's confronted by the king. I, you know, I think all the time, I wonder how often do I not recognize Jesus? How often do we not recognize who the Christ is? How is it that maybe our love of religion gets in our way of our following of God's will? Y'all are really quiet at this point. There's this place that stands between what God wants and where we are. This past week, I went on a retreat for one day. I don't know who thought this, actually I do know who thought the idea up, but think about this, a one-day retreat. I spent more time in the car than I did on the retreat. Uh, we, we were up near Bright Divinity, and uh, we were meeting with other pastors, and it's a season that we go through, we do it for a year, and as we met in this group, we're in the season of spring, and we were asking spring questions as opposed to fall questions. You notice that when you get in different stages of your life, you have different questions stages of questions about your life. Some of y'all might be in the fall questions. Some of you might be in the spring questions. Some of you might be in the summer questions. You following me? The different stages of our life. Well, the spring question is this. What is the gap between what is and what can be? What is the difference between what is and what can be? That difference between when we plant a seed and we harvest an ear of corn. You understand the, the question here? What is it that we are moving toward? What are we supposed to be versus what we presently are? And I think all too often our blindness to what it can be is caused because we're so in the moment of what is. We don't want to see where we should be. And I, I think all too often, we as the church, and I as myself, are caught up in the moment and not in the what can be. I'm all too comfortable with the Jesus who came to save me and get me into heaven to see the Jesus who came to bring heaven 
and put heaven in me here. I'm not altogether comfortable with the Jesus that came to reorder our lives so that society might be reordered. So that children can have education. So that there are people who have fresh water who don't. So that there are people on this earth who are no longer hungry but have something to eat. That Jesus, I would rather turn a blind eye to. Because he's like Jesus in front of Saul. You need to stop what you're doing and you're going to need to go another way. But he's calling us to a vision that God has, not a vision that we have. It's funny how these changes all roll out in life. You know, it's great how we as the religious people aren't always excited about the change. Have you ever noticed that? We already kind of have it together. One of the things that happened while I was at Kingwood was they put me in charge of discipleship, and I had men's ministry in, in that bailiwick, and I walked in and stepped on a landmine that I was unaware of. You know that can happen to new preachers? They can walk right in, and they're unaware of how things are really supposed to operate, and they just step on stuff. And I am as guilty as any preacher ever of doing it. In fact, I occasionally do it deliberately, but don't tell anybody. So I, I, I walked in, and there had been a long-running battle between the men's ministry that meets on Sunday morning and has breakfast and the men's group that meets on Friday and doesn't have breakfast. They have donuts. And, and, and the men's meeting that started on Sunday had been the long-running one, but over the last few years had been decreasing in attendance. And the one that met on Friday had increasing attendance and was having donuts and doing Bible study and going and doing acts of service. Well, the Sunday morning group invited me to increase attendance. And I thought, well, then, okay, well, I'll do that. So I changed the programming. We did a few things different. Attendance went from 20 to 50 people, and there were people mad at me. There were people angry with me. And in fact, I got a memo, an email, that was about me, but not to me. <laughs> you ever gotten one of those before? It was about me, but it wasn't to me. And it had the greatest line in it. It was really kind of interesting. It said this. It said, somebody needs to explain to Reverend Evans that men's ministry is based on scrambled eggs. <laughs> Crazy me. That would have saved me three years of seminary and about 40 grand. I thought it was based on Jesus, but I'm a crazy guy. I make fun of that because what I thought ministry should be about is educating and preparing people to go into ministry and sending them into ministry. But, but I was missing a part that needed to be there, that of fellowship. So, so we needed the both and. And so where I was putting an emphasis on one thing, they were calling me back to an emphasis on the other. And finally we ended up meeting and talking and, and there was healing that took place. And I said, well, let me be a consultant on your ministry and and let's redefine your ministry so that we can make it what you want. And they said, okay, well, we'll allow you to be our consultant. And I said, well, what would you define success as? And they said, 25 guys having breakfast on Sunday morning. Okay, well, we can do that. We can, we can have a time of fellowship. I, I thought you wanted something completely different. But what we want is the same but just a few more people. You see, that's the tension that's within the church all the time, isn't it? We, we can be tied up in wanting the same all the time, yet many times we can be, be calling out to something new. There is this tension always between the tradition and the traditional and the contemporary and the outreach. This tension that takes place. And we can't let go of either. We have to hold both in tension. Uh, Y'all you, probably are familiar with the worship wars. Have you heard of these? Uh, uh, between the different types of worship. There's the worship where we have the, the lovely organ and the traditional music. And, and then we have those with guitars and drums. You've heard of it before, right? And, and you know what? Within some churches, they have both. And in both, there's two groups kind of back and forth at each other. 
I find it somewhat amusing that we would have this at Asbury. I was on the chapel staff, and we had to plan these different worships. So we'd have traditional one day, the next day we'd have contemporary. And come to Native American week, we actually had Native Americans come, and we had Native American drums, and we had one of their services. And there was always somebody who was upset about all this. But what we have to do is we're called to hold on to the traditional and move into today at the same time. It sounds impossible, doesn't it? I, I think of the song that we sang today about Moses when he was in the desert. What happened? The flame stayed over the tent and then the smoke by day, the flame by night. And when it moved, what did the people do? They packed up their tent and they moved. And then when it stayed, they stayed. Sometimes I would like God to be that clear with us. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful? Okay, we get up and we go. And you know what? It ends a lot of discussion. Well, God moved. If you want to stay here, you can stay here. But we have to go where God is going. So this idea of tradition and this idea of contemporary, Marva Don wraps it up really well in a book she wrote called Holy Waste of Time, a book on worship. You ever think of this? This is a holy waste of time. She said, true worship is traditional and contemporary all at the same time. It is about the same story, the greatest story. It is about the ever unchanging God who was and is and is to come. That tradition never changes. But it's about what that God is doing in the here and now. And in that sense, it's always contemporary. True worship holds these together. And as Saul was blind to what God is doing, I ask that we not be blind. It required that the light of Jesus blinded him to the world of what he wanted so that he could see what is. And what... My prayer for you and my prayer for me is that may we be so blinded by Jesus that we become blind to the things we don't want to see. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.